welcome to another episode of the Soul Archive, the People's Story. Today, we are honoured to be joined by producer, songwriter, musician, uh, Rob Russon. Thank you for joining us, Rob. Thank you for having me, Jordan. Uh, nice to get a chance to chat with you live. We've been talking back and forth on Messenger for a while, and you're good. You have a good relationship with my two colleagues, uh, Mark and Des, MD Records. So, good guys. Good yeah, guys. good guys, real good guys. They've helped me a lot, and I thought, you know, I've, I've loved your music. I've, I've loved the tracks by the Ellingtons and I've loved the tracks by the Millionaires for so long. They've kind of, I've, I've kind of grew up with them tracks on the Northern Soul scene in the UK. And to be honest with you, I don't know a lot about the group. I've, I've read little bits online and I thought we need to get you on and we need to just for, for other people's sake as well. Do you know what I mean? To tell your story because it's not just them tracks either, is it? That you have got, Looking online, you have got quite a you know a large catalog of music from uh, the Castle Records, and no doubt you've had you know, a long you know career in music. Castle Records was formed by my father and his best friend in 1965 to help expose local talent in the Philadelphia area that were not being able to get exposure to the major labels. Um, so they chipped in some money, kind of like what Gamble and Huff did when they got started and around about the same time. Uh, and, and the Ellingtons and the Millionaires were the first two acts that recorded on the label. Um, Ellingtons actually formed while I was in college at Ryder University in New Jersey under the name The Banished. Three of the five Ellingtons were in The Banished. When I got out of college, we changed the name and went into an R&B vein as opposed to a rock vein. Mm. And uh, we're among the originators of the blue-eyed soul genre at that Definitely. time. There were not a lot of us. And, that, that's, uh, one of, that's one of my questions that I, I, I wanted to come on to with you, actually. But f firstly, when uh, you say that the, you went under another group name uh, when you was in college, did, did you yes. did you record then under that other group name or was uh, yes. yes yes oh right okay so that's something new I didn't know that it was called the banished b a n i s h e d it was called that because um, I had a dispute with my father when I went to college I grew my hair long and I wanted to be a musician he wanted me to be a mortician <laughs> quite a different turn. And I never saw that in my future. So yeah. he kicked me out of the house. He disowned me. Wow. I, I, was, right. okay. I was banished from my own home. But right. then two years, two years later, we got things straightened out, and he formed Castle Records. And so, um, did your father? Did you? Did your father have any? Um, what's the word? Uh, previous experience with record labels or musicians, or did he have any? You know, was he in the music career, uh, the industry back then? before Castle Records? My father? Yes, your father, yeah. No, he was no. just a straight up worker in a factory. Wow, you know? so that's pretty, that's, that's pretty amazing just to, to you know. Castle Records to, to give me a chance to see if there could be a career in music, hoping that it would not happen and I would go back and become a more <laughs> <laughs> So So the... So the Ellingtons and the Millionaires were the first two groups on Castle Records. And, and you say that the Ellingtons, yeah, well, you, you, was, you was part of the Ellingtons as well, wasn't you? Yes, I was the group leader, guitar player, and uh, songwriter. Wow. And I conducted the, the business. I booked all of our, our gigs. And we, we performed uh, a lot of college dates, fraternity dates, and uh, concerts, R&B concerts. Okay, so, you, so we were kind of unusual doing as much R and B as we were doing in those days. Yeah. Uh, so, what was the transition with uh, from the like the rock style of things, like you said, when you was under the other group name, to the more blue eyes uh, style? I know when we talked on Facebook, you uh, mentioned the Magnificent Men. Was they an inspiration to you? They were definitely an inspiration and uh, had great success in that area. Uh, 
tremendous group, great vocals, great arrangements. Uh, I admired them greatly. That's great. Uh, the transition, the original, the banished, the two record, the two songs we recorded, one was inspired by Van Morrison. I'm sure you know that name. Oh, yes. And, and the other was in, uh, inspired by uh, Bob Dylan and the Turtles song, It Ain't Me, Babe. Wow. Uh, so they were in the folk R&B genre and uh, were very popular at the time. Yeah, well, the Magnificent Men uh, equally loved just like your music. Do you know what I mean? That, that over here in the UK and on the Northern Soul uh, scene at the dances and the all night uh, parties that we have, that their records uh, are played just as much as uh, your records are. So that, that's a result in its own. Did they ever tour Great Britain? Um, the I'm, I'm not too sure. I, I have I have an LP of them uh, live at a place called Caesar's Palace, but I don't know any. I don't, I don't know where that is, but I, I know that's it's in America. I, I don't know if they ever come to the UK. That's something I'll have to look into. Interesting. Uh, they have a live album recorded at the Tower Theater in Philadelphia. Oh, Caesar's right. is a casino in Las Vegas. Oh right, okay. Oh well, there we go. Learn something new there. <laughs> Lead singer of the Magnificent Men. His name is David. Bup, B-U-P-P. He is on Facebook as well. So if you would ever want to get in touch with him, you can reach him on Facebook. Oh, well, that might be a, a future interview right there. <laughs> that, that might be somebody good to reach out to. You actually put me on some... Uh, you put me onto some really good contacts when we when we talked that time of uh, people that you knew as well. It's, it, it, it's amazing how um, so many groups and crossover, you know, know each other and know of each other. And I'm finding this out with these interviews. Everybody seems to have, you know, like helped each other and took influence from each other as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's sort of like a, a fraternity. Yeah. You know, once music, you know this because you're a young man, but music is in your soul. Yeah. It'll be there forever. You yeah. will not be able to walk away and forget about it. No. Music. No. Once it's in your system, it's there to stay. So you, you mentioned to us, well, you told us how uh, the, the Ellington, sorry, uh, met. You met in college and uh, you formed under another group name before uh, going to more of a blue-eyed uh, soul type. But the Millionaires, so they were the two first groups. How did the Millionaires come around? How did you find them? Let me go back to the Ellingtons for one second. Two okay. members of the Ellingtons were Bobby Aceto and Sonny Aceto. They were brothers, and we lived in the same housing development in Camden, New Jersey, called uh, Westfield Acres. So we grew up together playing ball, just being friends, and Bobby and I had the same guitar teacher, and the musical roots started there. He was, he was so good. He could have been Frankie Avalon, Bobby Rydell, Fabian. He was a great singer and had that the look of the, the 50s guys. It's just a damn shame he never got discovered by John Nadera and Dave White, who, who did most of the Philadelphia vocals at that time. Mm. But uh, so we, be, we became friends and stayed friends um, from that time on. The Millionaires, I went to high school with one of them, one of the background singers. And when he heard that my father had formed a label, he asked if we might be interested, and I auditioned them, and, and I was blown away by the great harmonies and the choreography. They were a typical Motown-type group, but in Philadelphia. Philadelphia and, and Motown were competitors in those days. Yes. You had the game half stable, and then you had the Motown stable. Motown had more commercial success, but Gamble and Huff went on from their own small label of Gamble Records to Philadelphia International and they became quite a substantial influence in the business from that point on. But at the time we were starting out, Gamble Records was their label. They started it by borrowing $500 and recorded a single by the intruders called uh, United. Which right. I'm not sure if you, that was their first hit and it took off from there. They ended wow. up buying, uh, leasing the rights to the Millionaire's record, as a matter of fact, but they never did release it. I never knew why. I don't know what happened to it but uh, um, it resurfaced in the uk in northern soul and i yeah i couldn't be, couldn't be happier the, so 
Go, I'm, I, all I'm going off now is the discography on uh, Discogs because that's been a great help for research for me. And I can see that the Millionaires, uh, they, they only had one release on you, Castle Records. Did they go on to do, uh, did they go somewhere else? Did they do other things? And how come they only had the one release? In 1967, uh, I entered the military and Castle Records went on a hiatus. Uh, the Millionaires went on to uh, record for Butch Ingram. I don't know if you're familiar with Butch's name. And with Bobby Eli, who was part of the um, TSOP orchestra for Gamble and Huff under the name Executive Suite. And they had a hit record, a disco hit record called When the Fuel Runs Out. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Wow, that's interesting to know. So, so you, went into the, you went into the army then? Air Force. Into the Air Force, sorry. Into the Air Force. So then, so did that put a halt to your, to, to the label, to, to, to things you was to doing the, with Castle? To the label temporarily, but I was stationed in a town called Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And I brought, which is a seaside resort. And I brought my band down there. So during the day I was a soldier and during the night I was playing music. So wow. the music. Music continued, my influences continued. I became familiar with the Southern style of music, which they call shag. I know yes. the word shag. Shag means something different in England. It than does. It it's, it's always made me laugh that when, uh, when people are aware of that, that, how it translates over here and they come over and it always makes people chuckle and laugh and nobody can tell why. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it does. That's where I became aware of the Tams and the Southern beach music as they call yeah. it shag music. yeah because uh, i'm a big fan of uh, the embers and uh, they was a shagging group as well wasn't they they're still around actually they're still yeah. performing the ellingtons as well they it's recently come to our attention that they had an unreleased album uh, that came up on uh, an acetate and so why did that get shelved at the time did um, because you know they, they were a great group and this acetate, this double-sided acetate came around and it had some great tracks on it. How come them, uh, them tracks got shelved? Was it to do with funding or was it something else? Partially due to funding. The uh, acetate was only meant to be a demo. Yeah. They were not finished, polished and produced songs. The original two records on Castle were musically backed by the Mike Douglas Orchestra. Mike Douglas had a TV show in Philadelphia every day, and we hired his house band to play the musical tracks on the finished product. The quality of music that they produced was top-notch professional, and I, we just didn't feel that what we were doing as the Ellingtons at that time was strong enough musically to compete with the Gamble and Huff orchestras and the Magnificent Men with horns and everything else. So it was just meant to be a demo that yeah. would ultimately be uh, further produced and then released. Um, I was shocked when you brought it to my attention that that acetate was floating around on eBay. Really pissed off about it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because we, we talked about that a lot, didn't we? And uh, we tried to help as much as we can, but they're, they're out there somewhere now. There were songs on there. I did get some of the many... Uh, edits that he put online that I forgot that I had written yeah. and, and that we re-recorded. Sonny Aceto and I were going and saying, wow, we forgot we did that. That was, that was pretty good. So um, what happened to your master tapes back then? Uh, how did that come around? Because I've spoke to various people in the studio and sometimes they said, well, the studio kept hold of our masters and we never took them home. And then other people say, oh yeah, we took them home, but they've been lost over the years and things like that. So what happened to your master tapes of them tracks? The studio kept track of them or held them. I'm not sure why. I guess because my father didn't know that once we paid the bill, we could take the masters with us. Mm. And uh, I don't know that I ever had the master tapes in my possession of okay. the Ellington's or the millionaires. We had the uh, stamping, the, the master, the things that the records Yeah, were the stamped. nickel stampers, the nickel stampers, yeah. yeah. And that's among the stuff that we gave to Gamble and Huff when they leased the, the product. But um, 
that's when you were telling me that uh, MD Records is looking to find a uh, alternative version of the unreleased Ellington song called "She Is Mine." There are none out there. I gave yeah. them every single copy I had available in every format I had available, including that acetate. Yeah, yeah. So that I could download off of that. Um, it's a different kind of song. She's yeah. Mine probably was the first rock rap combo record ever recorded. This was 1965. And uh, I don't know if you've heard it yet, but it's a Van Morrison song, very much like uh, when he was with a group called Them, and they had a song called uh, Gloria. Okay. It was a lot like that. Okay. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I don't actually, I've not actually uh, managed to, to listen to the track. Um, there was, I remember when the acetates did uh, come on the internet and they was on eBay for a while. I remember there was some little short uh, snippets of them. I did listen to them and I, I can't remember. I can't remember that one. I'll have to have a look back. The, 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 the studio, the studio you recorded at Rob was uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. Is it was it Baker Sound Studios? Yes. yes. And I, I did a little bit of research. Baker Sound. I did a little bit of research, and and there was a there was a little mention that it was in an old motel. Let me give you a little history. Castle Records was named after Camden High School. Right. We wanted something that was significant to the area. Camden High School was at the top of a hill, and it was called the Castle on a Hill. Oh, okay, um, right. As you came down that hill, uh, the hotel that you're talking about in Baker Street was very historical oriented that the sessions were recorded right there by the high school in the city that we were trying to support local music. And uh, I think it's no longer there. Matter of fact, Camden High School is no longer there. It's been knocked down and replaced with another school, but... That's a little bit of the history of the That's amazing. Where, where the name came from, Camden High School. That's really, really castle. interesting. I, I, I had a look into Baker Sound Studios as well, and uh, they are still active. Uh, although, you know, they, they have they have moved uh, premises now, but they are still around, which I found was uh, incredible. Do you know a studio from then uh, still being active? I didn't know that. Yeah. How about that? Maybe, yeah. They have, maybe they have the original master. Well, I, I did. have a feeling that... After a period of time, those studios would they would just uh, erase them and record over them. Yeah, those tapes were expensive in those days. I attended Woodrow Wilson High School, which is where I met the, one of the singers from The Millionaires. Uh, another classmate of mine, his name was Billy Vaughn. Billy recorded under the name Billy Abbott and the Jewels on Cameo Parkway. That was the first time I was ever associated with somebody who had an actual recording career going on. Cameo Parkway was a very big label at the time in the Philadelphia area. It was partially owned by Dick Clark, the famous television American bandstand guy. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Well, it was on the QT because that was the era of what was known as payola, where record labels played the DJs to play their records. Well, Dick Clark had had... Cameo Parkway create the records that he had a piece of, and then he would play them on American Bandstand and put the acts like the Orlans, the Dobells, Chubby Checker, the Dream Lovers on TV on a regular basis. But when he moved to California with American Bandstand, uh, Cameo Parkway kind of died out. Payola. Uh, when, when we speak to a lot of people in, in the States who had, uh, you know, uh, small records that they they just couldn't they just couldn't get the promotion on them and it was mainly due to the studio time the pressing cost the label design and then when they finally got these records in the hands they was then delivering them around to radio stations and they wanted basically bribery for playing them and it it really shelved a lot of the records people who did a job called promotion then and they would go around with a handful of sing, uh, singles 45 rpms every week to the radio stations and they would hand the record, and that's the incentive for the DJs to play the record. Most of the DJs in those time periods had a very fixed format. It was a top 40 list of songs, and that's what they were supposed to play. So to crack through to that top 40 was 
very, very difficult on the major radio stations. I can um, imagine. And something I, I thought about asking you as well is, did the Ellingtons and the Millionaires ever do any uh, live performances, uh, performing the tracks like I'm Not Destined to Become a Loser? Yes. They did? Yeah, we, did a, we did a small tour of military bases together where both of us performed our records and we did one 40 minute set each and it was a lot of fun but for us we were in the Ellingtons were in awe of the vocals of uh, the millionaires they were a little bit older and uh, very very polished very polished they they should have been big stars so should Bobby Aceto but again it goes back to that promotion yeah. The amazing thing about Northern Soul to me is that you have uncovered great music that people in America don't even know about. And it was recorded here. Yeah. It, and, it's, I, you know, I, I always wonder, like, I, I, maybe it is to do with the promotion. Maybe they just didn't get the promotion at the time to, to, to get them on, onto, you know, these, these big radio stations on, onto TV and things. But I, I always wonder, you know, uh, the Americans didn't, didn't seem to know what they had going for them back then. They, they had some incredible music and it, it just wasn't heard at the time. And I'm, I'm so glad that over here in the UK, it is appreciated and it is a loved because, you know, I, I see, I, I play your Ellington's records in my DJ spot a lot. And all, and I know all of my friends all love that to dance to it. And I know they, they can't wait to listen to this interview with you. So I just want to tell you that the music, your music is loved, loved so much over here. It's greatly appreciated. It's uh, been a long time since we recorded it. And, and one of the things that is a blessing is that you are able to bring new life to material that had been forgotten here. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, many of the acts may not still be alive and around, uh, and I guess the Northern soul scene isn't what it used to be when the, the Wigan Casino was up and running regularly in all those clubs. Uh, I see that you're running uh, all night soul sessions once in or so people were running like that, but I guess it was really quite a scene that you had there back in the seventies. Mm -hmm. huh? it, it was, it was, but back then in the seventies, they, they had maybe, you know, one club happening every weekend but now we have you know before the lockdown and the pandemic here in the uk you would have now like five six sometimes you know all night is happening on one evening and it's kind of spread spread the numbers out because back in the 70s everybody was going to one club so you had everybody in one place but now, but even in America, I, I, we did an interview with a girl called Sher, who's a DJ from Canada to get her perspective on the scene over there. And do you know what I mean? It's mad now, Northern Soul, what, you know, originated in the north of England has now gone global, really. People have really, with, with the internet, everybody is, is playing these records again and, and with MD records, digging out, unreleased tracks and licensing them as well. A big thing for us with MD is licensing direct from the people that own this music, because I know your tracks, your tracks got bootlegged in the seventies, which is really sad. I do hate bootleggers. I really do. Uh, my tracks made a lot of money for a lot of people, but not for me. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's so sad. I have, I have noticed that there are Northern soul clubs in Australia, in Italy, all, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at how worldwide it has become. It has with, with, with the, with the internet now, it has, like you say, it has gone worldwide and, and, and that's a, you know, it's a great thing for these people who have got previously unreleased tracks that now have uh, an audience to, you know, to, to sell them to as well. It's great. It's great. One of the things that amazes me is the dancing rhythm of the Northern soul dancers. As a musician, I'm like a metronome in my head. One, two, three, four, keep. And I can't figure out the footwork of the dancers. It's uh, really, I, I really, watch, watch, it, watch I used to dance on American Bandstand. We couldn't dance like that. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's developed. Amazing. The dancing has developed um, over like many years. And it, I know 
groups like the Flamingos and, and Jackie Wilson, uh, they were the inspirations at the time with how they used to drop back and do the splits and, and, and people took from that. But now it, it's kind of developed where you get a lot of people just like freestyling. And it's a, the, the Northern Soul scene, what attracted me to it the most is just being able to express yourself as being, you know, a male as well. Uh, and in this generation, you don't really get the time where you can dance, you know, on your own as well, and uh, you know, and, and lose yourself in in the music. It's fantastic, and I think that's what has a big appeal to the northern soul scene. I did notice that the dancers dance individually as opposed to as a couple. Yeah, and they can do their their own spinning around real fast and splits, yeah. and it's very exciting. It's crazy, I, isn't it? Um, I want to ask you about in a, a time in, in 1979 as well, uh, John Anderson had a label called Grapevine here in the UK and he yes. released uh, the Ellingtons and the Millionaires on a, a double-sided 45 uh, for the UK. Yes. And how did that come about? How did, how did John Anderson get in touch with you to, to release that track? Can you remember? I believe he contacted me via email which was fairly new in those days, and expressed an interest. I didn't know if he was serious or for real or not. Um, he actually wanted me to press the records in Philadelphia at the same place where I pressed them for Castle and send the finished product to him. He didn't release the master tapes. So um, I know he was unhappy with the, the pressing plant, which was called Frankfurt Wayne, they didn't use the blue label. They used a gray or a silver label with blue ink. And he uh, was not happy. Was, was this the same guy? Was, was, this wasn't... Um, I'm, I'm wondering now if this is the same person because this, uh, the label that I'm on about is the Grapevine label, which is a yellow label, and it's got, um, it's got kind of grapes on it, if you, if you know. Yes, I did see that one as well. Yeah. He ordered like 500 copies on Castle. I don't know what he did with them. I knew he was unhappy that they were on, the label was a different color. Mm. But uh, I was sort of, I knew, he, he told me that they sold out and I was kind of curious why he didn't reorder them. Perhaps he did multiple issues on his Grapevine label. Grapevine yeah. is now part of another company doing licensing in London as well, are they not? It was run originally by John Anderson, and then it went on to be run. It, they changed the name to Grapevine 2000 when it went into the noughties. And um, it was run by John Anderson and a guy called Dave Welding as well. Um, and they, they was doing the same thing that, you know, were, they're a big inspiration to us with MD Records, looking up to people like Dave Weldon. Dave Weldon now has a label called Soul Junction as well, which is a highly respected label in the UK, uh, putting previously unreleased music out. But it, it's just interesting. When did, you, when did you first become aware of the Northern Soul scene, uh, you know, appreciating your music? Uh, definitely not through Grapevine. I, I never made the connection. He did not explain to me how or why he was interested in the music. Um, Kev Roberts. Kev Roberts came to visit me in New Jersey and uh, actually bought some of the original pressing from my house when he came there. And that's when I first learned about it to some degree. Wow. Oh, well, I, I, you know, Kev Roberts is a great friend of mine. He's helped me over the years become, you know, giving me DJ spots and stuff. And he's still really active on, on the Northern Soul scene. So that's interesting. So Kev was the first guy to come and sit down with you and, and tell you about the scene over in the yes. UK. Yes. Oh, that's amazing. He actually and he laid his hands on the original product and took some of it with him. That's amazing. I was amazed. I, I have another act after after the Ellingtons and the Millionaires, I went back to hard rock music. And uh, after I got married in 1969, I had a band called Negative Space. Yes, yes. And that, that, they're a group I want to, want to ask you about because that is, um, you know, I'm not as knowledgeable about uh, these other groups that you did work with as well. And I know that they're really collectible as well. The Negative Space album. Album, sorry. Hard, heavy, mean, and evil, and uh, 
that same character that stole my records sold a copy of it on eBay last year for $1,400. Wow. For a single copy of that album. It's very rare. It's been in demand for a long time. I was told that uh, it was one of the most bootlegged rock albums. Matter of fact, uh, Monster Records called me about six or seven years ago. They hunted me down in Virginia when I was doing business in the boxing business. And they said, is this Rob Russell? I said, yes. He said, Rob Russell from Negative Space? I said, yes. He said, I've been trying to find you for five years. I said, why? Do I owe you money? <laughs> he said, no. I said, no, I want to license your album. Your album is one of the most bootlegged albums in Europe for the last 20 years. I said, you're kidding. Am I on candid camera or are you yeah. telling me the truth? He said, no, your record, you know, in various different variations, album covers, labels, Negative Space is like one of the founding fathers of heavy metal music. I said, wow, I had no idea it was that popular. I bet that so was a I made a deal. I bet that was a I great a feeling for you. It was strange. Um, you're still young, so you can't imagine what you did 40 or 50 years ago mm. being brought back to relevance. But uh, that's the great thing about music. It's good music is timeless. Definitely. And fortunately, when you have a group of people like the Northern Soul people who are attracted to uh, it's primarily R&B music, right? There's not a whole lot of... Yeah, you're right. Wake pop music, it's R&B dance music. Yeah, but the, there is a lot of uh, blue-eyed tracks and people, it's it's funny really because you get a lot of people that are like, oh, well, I, I don't want to dance to this because, you know, it's it's blue-eyed music. And then you see them dancing to other music, which they think is R&B music, and they realise then it is actually blue-eyed music. They, didn't, they never realise it. It does make me laugh. But the, there is some great tracks, like, like The yeah. Magnificent Men, of course, the harmonies with The Magnificent Men, are fantastic and I see people dancing to yes. them, them tracks all the time. I would have thought promoters from that era who were bringing over the acts for the Northern Soul acts might have tried to bring them over because they were not what would be considered a very expensive act for a promoter to hire. Yeah. Um, and they were great. They were just as good live as their records. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Is I, it I'm sorry that they broke up and they did a reunion around 10, 12 years ago. That oh. was pretty good. So the group, there are, there are, are, group members there still around? Reun- yes. If you check on YouTube for Magnificent Men Reunion or Live, uh, there were several tracks from the original time period. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And uh, something else I wanted to speak to you about was uh, a track by uh, Dirty Mantha and uh, she's not there uh, that I, I was playing that track today because i was doing a little bit of research and, and getting myself familiar with some of the tracks that i didn't know out of your catalog of music and i was playing that to my uh, partner and girlfriend charlotte and she was saying that is so fantastic she she was she she was out of the room and she came in she says what is that that's brilliant so i'd love you to to expand a little bit on that and tell us about that track. Dirty Martha was a self-contained foreign group from South Jersey, across the river from Philadelphia, very much in the style of the band Chicago. They had a great rhythm section. The lead singer went on to work for Barry Manilow and, and now is working out in Las Vegas. That particular song, of course, was originally done by the Zombies, which was a big hit in the UK and in the United States, but in a different style. Dirty wow. Martha, made it made it into a jazz oriented uh, arrangement and uh, it became a local hit for them in the philadelphia area oh well that, and, that's uh, that's that's really interesting actually because my partner charlotte said this sounds so familiar she said i think i think i know this track and i said do you i said but, so zombies. maybe the zombies i'll have to play that to her when she when she comes back <laughs> That was a very, I recorded four songs by them, and uh, they were one of the top nightclub bands. They, had, they were full-time working musicians. 
five, six, seven nights a week in the top rock clubs in the Philadelphia area. Philadelphia was such a great musical area. So many great musicians and bands. Um, one of my friends was named Len Barry. I don't know if you know the name. Oh, of the band wow. Band. Yes, yes, of course. Legend. With song one, two, three. And then he was also lead singer for the Dovells. He just passed away recently. And uh, he was one of the typical guys who were street corner singers, like the doo-wop singers before them. And that's kind of what the R&B sound came from. I don't know if you've ever heard uh, the Ellingtons do uh, the acapella songs from uh, the internet. There's a So Much in Love by the Times, uh, Take Me Back from the Rocky movies. Um, acapella was very much a part of R&B music in those days. R&B music was usually an R&B singer or vocal group and then a backup band. They weren't usually totally self-contained. The Magnificent Men and, and the Ellingtons were quite different like that. They were both a vocal group and musicians playing together. Wow. Um, wow. When you would go to show at, at the Apollo or at the uh, Uptown Theater in Philadelphia, there would be a house orchestra, and they would back up all of the vocal groups scheduled to appear that night. Uh, I used to go there fairly regularly, and I saw uh, Stevie Wonder, uh, Billy Stewart, the uh, the Mad Lads, The Magnificent Men, Jackie Wilson. I was at the Latin Casino the night Jackie Wilson had his heart attack. I was sitting really? front row, front row center, and he was the headliner on the show. Dick Clark presented an, an oldie show, and he was singing Lonely Teardrops. And there's a part of that song where he says, my heart, my heart is crying, and he grabbed his chest, and he fell over backwards. And everybody thought that was part of the show. And he lay there and he lay there about 30 seconds. Dick Clark came running out on stage and said, is there a doctor in the house? We were shocked. We didn't know what happened. And that's the sad ending wow. to that story. He remained in a coma until he died. Wow. That's incredible. I've, I've got, I've, seriously, I've got goosebumps you're telling that because that's, that's so sad. That really is so sad. The timing where he's singing, my heart, my heart. And he grabs his chest because he's having a massive heart attack. And he falls over into a coma. Wow. Yeah. It was a very sad night. But uh, I only lived maybe a mile away from that venue. It was called the Latin Casino. Before the casinos opened up in New Jersey, down at the shore, it was the biggest showcase for big name stars. Uh, Tom Jones, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, all those guys would perform there. And uh, Dick Clark, I think it was around New Year's Eve or Christmas time, when that show was happening. I've also seen The Temptations there. and It was a great venue. It said that because Atlantic City opened up, they would put a res mileage restriction in the contracts for the entertainers. If you worked a casino in Atlantic City, you could not work anywhere within a 100-mile radius because they wanted to protect their yeah. ticket sales and their promotional rights. Keep them exclusive. That yeah. That kind of hurt their ability to get maximum work in those yeah. days but so now nowadays rob uh you you live out in uh, the philippines yes so yes. how how did uh how did that happen when did your what happened after castle records uh how did you know that starts fade out for you and, and what did you do afterwards what got you over into the philippines i'd love to know uh divorce i got divorced twice from american women um and I decided I wanted to try something different. Um, I was always attracted to Asian women. And uh, I came over, matter of fact, not too many people know this, but in July 11th, 2009, I was advised by my doctors that I had uh, phase four prostate cancer and I was going to die soon. They said, don't make any plans go home, say goodbye, get your things in order. And I said, uh, that's not acceptable. I'm so, I've got plans. I've already bought a ticket. I'm going to the Philippines. So if I'm going to die, I will die in the Philippines. Wow. Uh, my fiance that introduced me to a cousin of hers who is a famous herbalist. Uh, the Philippines is part of what's known as the Ring of Fire. 
there are volcanoes under the ocean underground have very potent soil. So any seeds of vegetables, herbs, spices that are grown in volcanic soil have maximum potency. Her cousin had been studying ancient Asian medicine for 20 years. He heard that I was told that I was going to die any day now. And he came to me and said, do you mind if I try to help? I said, I would love it. The doctors gave up. They didn't even want to try. No chemotherapy, no nothing. So he came back two weeks later and he gave me a bottle of capsules. He said, these capsules contain 18 ingredients that are known in ancient Asian medicine for their cancer-fighting properties. Any one of them, for example, um, one of them in particular is um, graviola. The University of Purdue did a study on graviola and said that it's 10,000 times more effective at killing cancer cells than chemotherapy is. Wow. And it does not, it does not harm healthy cells. Chemotherapy does. It kills all kinds of cells. So he said, if one of them is that effective, imagine if you have 18 ingredients that have been saving people from cancer for 2,000 years. I said, okay, you sold me. I'll give it a try. Here I am in, in July. It'll be 12 years later since they told me I was going to die. The only thing that I have been taking is these pills that he put together. They're called uh, Formula G Teen. And uh, I've been advising other people who contact me who have cancer or afraid of getting cancer, showing them how they can beat cancer naturally with no side benefits. And I'm living proof that it works. That's fantastic. And uh, do you know so what? Being saved my life. That's incredible. Do you know yeah. what, what a story, what a story from start to finish of this interview. It's been fantastic. It really has. And I, you're incredible, really. And, and, and that's just tops it really. It's great that you are still here and it's great that, myself and MD Records and still get the chance to work with you and uh, tell the story of your music because this this interview do you know what I mean as much as it is about all the great groups that you have it's also about you and because you've pulled all this together so thank you Rob Russon thank you for this great interview well thank you for having me Jordan it's been a pleasure and I would uh, I have been to the UK a few times in the boxing business uh, I came over for a promoter named Mickey Duff and we fought at Wembley and at Albert Hall and was really exciting. Um, so I have great memories of the UK and sort of sad that the Ellingtons never had a chance to come over there. But if there are any promoters who ever want to do a reunion type tour for autographs, personal appearances, there are still three members of the Ellingtons alive and well, and three members of the Millionaires are alive and well. And I'm sure they would love to come over and sign autographs and meet and chat and do those sort of things that we call here meet and greet here in the United States. Um, well, there you go. From, from Rob Russon's mouth himself, if there is anybody out there, because the Northern Soul page that this goes out on and our YouTube page has got so many subscribers. And from Rob Russon himself, is there any anybody out there that wants to do a reunion or, as Rob says, a meet and greet? They should contact Jordan Wilson. Contact Jordan Wilson and he'll make it happen. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, that brings the interview to a, a close. If there's anything else that you want to mention, any, anybody you want to give a shout out to or mention or anything like that, uh, now, now's your time. I just want to say thank you to you and all the fans of Northern Soul Music. You, you've brought a revival to the music of many American acts that have been forgotten about along the way. And, we appreciate it very much. Thank you so much, Rob Russon. And I'll speak to you, no doubt, on Facebook very soon. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you. Take care. Give my okay. best to Charlotte. I will do.